Well, good afternoon, as ever, it's good to see you. Let's start with three stories. Boris Bloom was a Russian diplomat. On one assignment, he and his wife were living in Lausanne in Switzerland. To their delight, baby Andre was born. As a diplomat, uh, the father was posted to various embassies around Europe. In the 1930s, when Andre was a teenager, they were living in Paris. By the time of uh, this, by this time, Andre was aggressively anti-Christian. He hated everything to do with God. But one day he found himself unwillingly listening to a talk by a priest. He found the priest's picture of Christianity repulsive. After the talk, he decided to read a gospel. He wanted to check out whether or not what he had heard was accurate. And not to waste any time, he chose Mark, the shortest gospel. Before he reached the third chapter, Andre was suddenly aware that on the other side of his desk stood the risen Jesus. His hostility crumbled and he became a follower of Jesus. Eventually, Anthony Bloom became Archbishop of the Russian Orthodox Church in Great Britain and Ireland. Second story. I had a fine friend in high school, David, his real name. I tried to introduce him to Jesus, but he wasn't interested. I even gave him a copy of the Good News New Testament, which had just been published. High school ended and we lost contact with each other. Twenty years later, I was a pastor. We'd not been long in the church when a man came up to me and asked if I remembered a David. This was David's brother. His brother told me that in midlife, David went through some struggles. One day in his crisis, David remembered the Bible that Twelfth Tree had given him. He hunted for it, finding it in a trunk. He sat down, opened it at random and began to read. He happened to read Paul's letter to the Romans. It's about the new life that God gives those who put their trust in Christ. There and then, David surrendered his life to God. When I heard the story, David was a changed man. And sometime later, I was so pleased to be able to meet David again. Third story. In China, people are flocking to church. The Bible, once banned and destroyed, is now the best-selling book in China. To keep up with, de with the demand, the major Christian printing press in the country is turning out 15 million copies of the Bible every year. When Chinese Christians get a Bible, there can be great excitement. Have a look. <laughs> What is this book that people clamor to read? It sells a hundred million copies a year around the world. So far, that's over five billion copies that have been made of the Bible. On Kindle, the Bible is the most highlighted book. And as, and as of November last year, the entire Bible had been translated into 531 languages. And 2,883 languages have at least some part of the Bible in print. What is this book that God so often uses to change people's lives? 
Well, this weekend we're between one series of talks and another, and we're taking the opportunity to look at the Bible and how to read it. And so our first heading is, What is the Bible? At one level, that's really easy to answer. It's a book, and it contains about 800,000 words. That's around eight or ten times longer than the average book. But when you open it up, it's not like most books. Between the covers, there's actually 66 smaller books. The first 39 are called the Old Testament. They were written in Hebrew, though some small sections are written in Aramaic. The last 27, written in Greek, are called the New Testament. That word testament means covenant or agreement that God made with people. Some books like Isaiah in the Old Testament were written in stages by two or three different writers. Some writers, like Paul, wrote a number of books in the New Testament. In Paul's case, they're letters. They're real letters written to real people, followers of Jesus. Some writers lived hundreds of years B.C. The writer of the book of Judges in the Old Testament would be an example. Other writers lived near the end of the first century A.D. The writers of Jude, Second Peter in the New Testament would be examples. So when you think about it, it's, it's obvious. Here's the first thing you, you can write in. The Bible grew. The Bible grew. As we know it, the Bible started life among the Jews. It began with laws and stories and wisdom and songs that God gave his people, being carefully handed down from one generation to the next. Eventually, these treasures were collected and written down. And around six centuries before Jesus, the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, became central to Jewish faith. The Jews still call that part of their Bible the Torah, or law. Sometimes it's called the Pentateuch, which just means five scrolls. Interestingly, for the 775 remaining Samaritans in the world... That's their Bible. Then by just two centuries, one or two centuries before Jesus, most Jews accepted another collection of scrolls as telling them about God and guarding their life. They called these scrolls the prophets. But it included not only prophets like Jeremiah, but also historical books like Joshua and Kings. And then came the third section known as the writings or wisdom literature or just the other books. These are the Psalms and Esther and Chronicles, for example. Around the time of Jesus, these books were widely used for instruction and wisdom. Of course, these books were not books and they weren't between covers. They were scrolls. And they were really all in one place at any one time. Jesus and his followers accepted the law, the prophets, and the writings as their scriptures, their holy writings. Jesus is depicted as uh, quoting the Old Testament. And many times we find Paul saying, as it is written, as it is written. And then he goes on to quote Deuteronomy or Psalms or Isaiah, for example. What we call the New Testament didn't begin with the story of Jesus in the Gospels, as we might expect. The first book written was Paul's letter, way in the, back in the New Testament, uh, called 1 Thessalonians. And that was perhaps in the year 50. And it wasn't too long before his letters were being collected. Then the four Gospels were written, perhaps between the late 60s and the 90s. And by the early years of the hundreds, they were being collected together. Some books took a long time to gain a place in the Bible. Books like James, Jude, 2 and 3 John, 2 Peter, Hebrews and Revelation were still being debated in the 300s and 400s. The man who put an end to all the debating was St. Augustine, one of the greatest minds and Christians to have graced the earth. It was in the year 393 after a church council that Bishop 
Augustine said this, it's been decided besides the canonical scriptures, nothing shall be read in church under the name of divine scriptures. And Augustine then goes on to list the books that we call the Bible, though the order of the books is a bit different from what we know. And perhaps I should say that different branches of the church, Protestants, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Armenian, Coptic, Syriac Christians, all have slightly different books in their Bible. So that's the first thing to say, the Bible grew. How are you managing this? Do we need to take a coffee break? I promise you'll get an A for this in class. <laughs> anyway, the next thing to say is the Bible is different. Now, of course, the Bible's different from other books because it has all those little numbers inside of it. It wasn't always like that. For example, look at what is known as papyrus or P66. Interestingly, it's not a scroll, but it's a six-inch book or codex of 104 pages. And it was the Christians who championed this new device for storing data, the book. And this is the first page of a near-complete copy of John's Gospel from around the time 200. And you can see that it was one continuous text. There aren't even any word breaks. And there's hardly any punctuation. There had been other ways to divide up the text to help us find our way around, but it was in 1205 that Stephen Langton, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, gave us the chapter divisions, the big numbers in the margins. And it was a Frenchman, Roberta Stephanus, in the 1500s who gave us the little verse numbers so we can help each other find our way around this big book. The problem with seeing all these numbers is that we can begin to see the Bible as a big collection of quotations. So we need to remember that we're likely reading a story or a letter or a hymn, not just a list of quotes. The Bible's also different in ways that we can't always see. When we read something by Harper Lee or John Grisham or James Patterson, well, Barbara does, I don't. We're not particularly aware of any distance between our world and what we're reading. But the Bible comes to us from a very different world. Think of its languages. It was written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. We have to read it in translation. Think of the culture. It's Eastern. Most of us are Western. We're dominated by the idea of individual initiative. They thought in terms of family and community responsibility. Our world's full of skyscrapers and traffic jams. Their world was, most, their world was mostly little houses and crops and sheep. Think of the time. We have Skype and open heart surgery and can live long lives. They travelled in a day what, at, what it takes us 30 minutes to travel on the interstate. And they only lived to what we would call middle-aged. When we come to the Bible, it's important to keep these differences in mind. Otherwise, we might miss what they're trying to say. For example, Jesus tells the story of a farmer going out to sow a crop. For us, that means a person sitting in an air-conditioned cabin on a tractor with precision GPS going at seven mile an hour, pulling a 60-foot air seeder covering 40 acres an hour, and the land will be relatively flat and clean. But for Jesus, a sow was a man walking slowly along, casting seed around on rough ground with a bush here and there. The point here is that the Bible was written in a very different world from ours. If we're going to hear its message, we'll often have to put ourselves back into that world. Now there are two very important things to say about the Bible. We really need to say them at the same time because they're both important. But as we've already come across the idea, we'll start with the one, the Bible is a human book. 
from the way that the Bible was collected over thousands of years, or 8,000 years, to become what we now call the Bible, we can see that it's come to us through human hands. And coming to us through human hands has left us with some puzzles. For example, we don't have what the, what the biblical writers actually wrote. We've only got copies of copies of copies. And in some places, there are differences between them. For example, if you turn over to John chapter 8, you'll find the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery. And if you look closely, you'll see that the story is put in brackets. That's because we don't know where that story belongs. In some ancient texts, the story is in other places in John or in Luke. But the Bible's not only a human book. It's also, write this in, the Bible is inspired by God. Some very important words are used to describe the Bible. There's the word inerrant. This word can be used to say that when it comes to knowing God and how to live, the Bible is without error. There's also the word infallible. This word can be used to say that its teaching can be trusted. I like the word inspired. It's the word that's used in the New Testament for the Old Testament. And some of you probably know this statement. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Paul, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John may have been normal human beings. But as we read what they wrote, we see that there is more than human communication taking place. It's the conviction of near 2,000 years of followers of Jesus that the God we meet in our own lives, we also meet when we read the Bible. The God whose love grips us, bringing us security and hope, whose experience of forgiveness brings us relief and a new start, the Spirit who empowers us, inspires our lives. That's the God that we also meet in the Bible. The Bible may be a human book, but it's also a book through which we can encounter God himself. So the next thing, the Bible brings a message from God. Sometimes with 66 books and many different writers, in the early days of reading it, it can, we can get a bit lost and feel we don't know where we're going. But there are some places where its central theme shines out, plain, simple and obvious. Listen to this well-known summary of the message of the Bible. You know this one. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who puts their trust in him may not perish but have eternal life. That is the biblical message we take from God. It's no wonder that people clamour to get their hands on this book. Well, we're already answering the next question. Why read the Bible? Why read the Bible? We read the Bible because we encounter God through its pages. We read the Bible because it's our earliest information about Jesus. We read the Bible because it's our earliest information about how we should live for Jesus. We're keen to read the Old Testament because that was the Bible of Jesus and his early followers. We want to learn what they learned. We read the Bible because it's our Christian family history. It's our treasure chest of stories, songs, wise guidance that has been handed down to us by the family of God. We read the Bible because all the great men and women of God, the heroes and heroines of our faith, have loved and read this book. We read this book because we see the best explanations of suffering and pain. We read this book because we see in it a clear description of the solution to our personal problems and the problems of our community. We read the Bible because, as Tertullian put it, with these holy words, we feed our hope, we, lift our, we, lift, we feed our faith, we lift our hope, we confirm our confidence. Are you convinced? 
No, well, I'll give you another one. We read this book because it tells us about the one who changes our lives and the lives of our families. If you've seen one of the movies, you'll know some of the story of the mutiny on the bounty. In 1787, Lieutenant William Bly sailed from London. When the bounty reached Tahiti in the Pacific Ocean, the crew thought they had arrived in paradise. Soon every sailor had a girlfriend. Not surprisingly, even though they could take their girlfriends, there was a great deal of grumbling when Bly announced that they were going to leave this heaven on earth. A few days out of Tahiti, Bly woke up to find himself looking down the barrel of a gun. Bly and 18 officers were put in a small boat and set adrift without maps. Fletcher Christian, the mutineers and the girls set sail. They came across Pitcairn, Pitcairn Island. What looked like another paradise turned out to be 10 years of hell. One of the sailors used a copper kettle to make a distillery. The men spent days, weeks and months on end plastered, do you use that word, plastered by this fire water. Some of the men went mad and became like animals. After several years, only two men remained, Edward Young and Alexander Smith. One night the women seized the guns and barricaded themselves and the 18 children off from the men. Neither the women nor the children would go near the two men. One day Young went to the ship's chest. At the bottom, among the papers, he found a book. It was a leather-bound, old, mildewed and warm, worm-eaten Bible. The two men, utter wrecks, began to read the Bible together. They started at Genesis. They saw from the Old Testament that God was holy and that they were sinful. They did their best to pray. The little children were the first to come back. They noticed a change in the men. Then the children went and got the women. And they sat and listened to them read. During this time, Young died. And then Smith, still reading, came to the New Testament. Something happened to him as he read the story of Jesus. He said this, I find this so moving. I had been working like a mole for years and suddenly it was as if the doors flew wide open and I saw the light and I met God in Christ Jesus. And the burden of my sin rolled away and I found new life in Christ. Eighteen years after the mutiny, a ship from Boston arrived at Pitcairn. The captain went ashore. He found people who were godly. When the captain returned to the United States, he reported that in all his travels, he had never seen or met a people who were so good, gracious, or loving. And it all began with people reading the Bible. If you've not done so, I urge you to join so many people in this room, my wife's husband included, who read the Bible every single day of their lives. St. Gregory said this, Holy Scripture is a stream in which the elephant may swim and the lamb may wade. So don't be intimidated by it. Begin to read it. But how do you read it? Where do you start? That's our next heading. How do you read the Bible? How to read the Bible? There are probably many things to say. But here are six suggestions that may help you in reading the Bible. Number one, find a time and a place. Maybe first thing in the morning. Perhaps it will be during your lunch hour. Perhaps it's going to be the last thing at night that suits you. Perhaps it will be sitting at the kitchen table or in the living room or in the car before you go into work. 
but find a time and a place that works for you. Number two, make a commitment to read it regularly. I've mentioned my academic grandfather before, Charlie Mole of Cambridge University. He taught the man who taught me at Nottingham University. Every day, every day of Charlie's adult life, he took time to read a passage of the Bible. And I wouldn't mind betting that the Christian that you admire most is someone who reads the Bible regularly. Let's make a commitment to read the Bible every day. And then tell at least one other person what you're doing and they'll hold you accountable. Number three, use a good translation. There are over a hundred English translations that you could choose from. Your small group leader can probably help you choose which one suits you. Or the Bible Society in Britain has some good suggestions on its website. My favourite is the New Revised Standard Version, Study Bible. I like the notes at the bottom and the little introductions to each book. They help me get my bearings on what I'm going to read. Number four, read the Bible thoughtfully. If you don't like that word, write another one in after you've heard what I've said. So, but for the, for the moment, write in thoughtfully. Quite often, our son in London will Skype so we can hear two grandsons read. Sometimes it's a Mr. Zeus book that sparks the imagination. Sometimes it's a science book that raises questions about the world. Sometimes it's a joke book. Grandpa, what do you get when you cross a cow and a duck? I don't know, milk and quaggers. <laughs> Grandpa, what sound do porcupines make when they kiss? I don't know, ouch. <laughs> Even children can tell that different kinds of literature are read and responded to in different ways. The Bible has many different kinds of literature in it that need to be read in different ways. The book of Acts, the fifth book in the New Testament, is the story of the followers of Jesus after Easter. It's a kind of what happened and why book. The book of Psalms in the Old Testament is a collection of songs and prayers. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, in them there are stories or parables that Jesus told. They're stories with a moral or a meaning. Some books are a little tricky. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament could be prophecy, telling what God would do in the future. Or it could be apocalyptic literature. That's the kind of literature that can look like prophecy, but was actually talking about the present. Some books, like those written by Paul, are real letters. Some books, like Revelation, the last one in the Bible, has different kinds of literature within it. In reading the Bible thoughtfully, we're trying to read it in the way that the writers meant it to be read. For example, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. A Jewish man has been ambushed and beaten by robbers. Jewish leaders passing by don't offer any help. Instead, it was a Samaritan, hated by the Jews, who looked after him, taking him to an inn, motel. Jesus told that story simply to make the point that we show care to our neighbours, those around us. But now and then, over the centuries, some folk have famously allegorised and misread this story. The man who was ambushed represents sinful people. The robbers are the devil and his minions. The Jews not helping the man of the Old Testament, law and the prophets. The Samaritan is Christ. And the inn is the church. Now all this allegorising might be fun and it makes us seem very clever... But it isn't what Jesus and the gospel writers had in mind. We're going to get the most out of the Bible when we read it in the way that the writers meant it to be read. Just like my marriage would be a lot better 
if my wife didn't deliberately misunderstand what I say. <laughs> you think that's funny? <laughs> Five, read the Bible humbly with others. Read the Bible humbly with others. There are some kooky Christians about. There are none in this church. In this church, we are all wonderfully sensible and well-balanced. But we all know one or two wacky Christians. They've read some obscure verse and concluded that the world is going to end on Tuesday afternoon. Or they tell us that the beast in Revelation is Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And perhaps you agree. <laughs> or they think that if you're a good Christian, you can expect to be prosperous. The best way to read the Bible in the way that it was intended is to read it with the help of others. By that I mean check with your small group leader about the meaning of a passage that you find is puzzling. I mean read the Bible in the way that most Christians have read it through history and understood it. And that might mean humbly giving up some favourite but silly idea about its message. Number six, read the Bible with help. Read the Bible with help. As a young fellow, I once started reading the Bible from the very beginning. For a while, it was really interesting. Then I got lost and puzzled. And I gave up and started to read something a bit more interesting in the Bible. These days, there are websites and apps that help us know where to begin. And your small group leader, again, can be a terrific help in knowing where to begin. You might find the Gospel of Mark a good place to start. In any case, on the handout, on the back, down the bottom, you'll find some suggestions as to where you can find helps. Some time ago, I heard of a wealthy man who was very interested in BMW cars. As an expression of his devotion, he bought a manual for one of the current models. He enjoyed reading it. So he decided that Early each morning, he'd get up and read it more carefully, section by section. There were some sections that seemed particularly interesting, though he underlined. Sometimes he used different coloured pens. What seemed to be the more important sentences, he began to memorise. Then there were a few lines he wrote out on what, like, what looked like little business cards, and he even laminated them and put them up on the mirror so that he could see them when he was shaving he discovered that there were other people in his area who also had BMW handbooks. Our young, man, our young man joined a group of these folk. The group met once a week in each other's home to study their manuals. They'd each bring different editions of the manual and compare what they said about various aspects of the BMW car. In time, our young man decided to take the next step. He decided to enrol in a night course to study German. He wanted to be able to read the manual in the original language. Yet, would you believe it? He never bought a BMW car. If you haven't guessed it, that's a parable. It helps us see that the Bible isn't an end in itself. The Bible isn't God. It's from God, and it points us to God. St. Augustine said the Bible was a letter from home. So we need to do more than take up that first challenge to read it. The second challenge is that we take the step to embrace the God and the life that it talks about. The most famous story in the Bible that Jesus told is that of the lost son or the prodigal son. It's the story of a young man who leaves home for the good life. Things don't go as well as he'd, as he'd planned. He ends up with a job feeding pigs. In shame and embarrassment, he realises that he'd be better off going home. On the way home, he rehearses a couple of lines to say to his father, 
And then as Jesus tells the story, it goes like this. While he was still far off, his father saw him and filled with compassion, he ran. And men in those days never ran. And put his arms around him and kissed him. The father wasn't interested in excuses or explanations. The point of that parable is to show that God waits and waits and waits for us to come to him. And God's waiting for some of us to come back to him or come to him. The father who loves us is waiting for you. All you need to do is tell him. Let's stand to pray. I'm going to pray pretending that I'm you coming back to God. So if you'd like to come back to God, you make the words that I say your own words in the quietness of your own mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of the Bible. Thank you that it makes it very clear that you love me. I'm sorry that I've been living my life away from you. I want to come home to you. Thank you for your acceptance and embrace and forgiveness. I surrender myself to you so you can guide and empower me to live for you. Amen.